gets his panties in a bunch. He's there. He just the ringy dingies have to type. One ringy dingy, two ringy dingies. Hello, your eminence. Hello, your affluence. I was just chatting with the people in the chat room, and I was going to show them a picture of my parents, but then you showed up and ruined our mood. So, what do you want to talk about today, old learned one? Well, I think it's very interesting that we seem to be closing in to the monstrous conspiracy of which J. Edgar Hoover spoke, and perhaps indirectly JFK when he talked about guerrillas in the night. Do you know where I'm going there? Yes, I do know where you're going, and I think J. Edgar Hoover and John F. Kennedy uh, were in different ways naive. But anyway, since you're making a lot of noise anyway, why don't you go ahead and speak and tell us where you're going. Okay, I see after Berner has put up a picture of your beloved sister. Beloved to whom? <laughs> well, her uh, late dear departed lesbian girlfriend, I suppose. Yeah, you mean Huma, or you mean Hillary, or do you mean Leah Guaria? Guaria. Okay, because they like foursomes. But anyway, continue. Okay, so... We know that these women were celebrating the reinvention of government without apparently the knowledge and consent of the governed on the 22nd of October 1996, about two months before little John Bonet Ramsey was garroted and raped and all kinds of unimaginable indignities inflicted on the poor child's body. So I think you and I have always been a bit puzzled about how these women who couldn't run a collective work stand, could reinvent the government of the United States. Is that a fair assessment? Over to you. Yes, but I'm trying to decide, David. I've come at a very critical point, a juncture in my life, and at age 65 and 10 months, I'm wondering if I should have a pear or a blackberry drop from Cavendish and Harvey. Which one do you recommend I have, pear or blackberry? Uh, well, would blackberry be racist? Oh, yeah, I forgot. Um, well, I have a pair. Do you have a pair? Well, I did. <laughs> well, take a look. You probably, unless you had them removed, you still might have a pair. No, I've got a window out into the garden, so I don't want the locals to uh, uh, get into a state of panic. Uh, moving on. Um, so they re reinvent government, these women, and the three projects for which they attributed that uh, ability to reinvent government were JABS, JPATS, and Sentry. <laughs> Sentry is a system that allows the drugs and the guns to cross the Mexican-United States border and uh, accumulate in weapons and drug caches around the United States, presumably, for the next big one, if they can materialize it. I'm not sure with Jade Helm that they haven't been scared off by us. What do you think, Field? Over to you. Well, do you, are you familiar with the name Thomas M. Mead? Uh, yeah, isn't he an 8A uh, flunky? Yeah, he has ICE, I-C-E. <clears throat> it's a private contractor, and what they do is they attempt to scare everybody in America, but they're not scaring certain people, and those certain people are scaring the shit out of Tommy Mead and his buddies at the JFK school at an Army base, and so that the army base doesn't get overrun with paparazzi, or is it paparazzi? Who cares? It's not Liberace, uh, which reminds me, speaking of Liberace, <clears throat> uh, there's a great old song that goes, well, I can't remember it, I don't have time to sing, but Liberace, as you know, was a gay guy, and that's, that's no harm, no foul, but he was very popular at about the same time Rock Hudson, another gay guy, was very popular. And Rock Hudson played the lead role in a movie in 1963 called A Gathering of Eagles. And it was also in 1963. And I know there's going to be some quick thinking people out there that are going to think I'm wrong, but I'm not. So don't think quite so quick. In 1963, another movie called Dr. Strangelove was made, but it didn't get released until 1964 because the, and, and Dr. Strangelove, just like the Wizard of Oz, Dr. Strangelove was a way of Hollywood saying what was going to happen in the United States of America. 
But Kennedy's death on November 22nd of 1963 made the people who created the movie sort of choke and swallow hard. I say again, swallow hard. Because they were making fun of the president, and you can't make this up. The president's name in the movie was Merkin Muffley. David, do you know what a Merkin is? If you do know what a Merkin is, turn your mic on and say yes. And if you don't, turn your mic on and say no. Okay, mic's on. Yes and no. Okay, do you know what a Merkin is? Uh, yes. Uh, do you understand the significance of the surname Muffley? Muffley, is that a muff diver? I think you're referring to MUFFDVR, which was Marine Uncovers False Flag doing virtual reconnaissance. And some of that virtual reconnaissance occurred on the evening of October 14th of 2008 when my sister, a notorious lesbian, Christine Marcy, left her laptop plugged in charging on my dad's kitchen table. And uh, the hard drive may or may not have been removed uh, duplicated and reinstalled. You just never know. But anyway, uh, Muff Diver, that's, uh, if anybody wants to Google it, just put in CHIPS, C-H-I-P-S, plus Hamish, H-A-M-I-S-H, plus Pastel, plus I-O-C, plus the acronym M-U-F-F space D-V-R, D-V-R, Delta Victor uh, Romeo. That stands for Marine Uncovers False Flags During Virtual Reconnaissance. And the fact that these people in Hollywood, who are a bunch of, uh, they're, they're greedy Jewish people for certain, I think a lot of them are pedophiles, and I think the majority of them are gay or bisexual. But in 1963, they were really trying to cram homosexuality and uh, they were trying to weaken the US military and by sticking a known gay like Rock Hudson in the lead role of gathering of eagles and then using the names like Buck Turgidson, Bat Guano, and Merkin Muffley, these uh, queers in Hollywood thought they could simultaneously destroy the morality of America, which they 93% accomplished, and also destroyed the U.S. military, which they have probably accomplished to about 37%. Uh, but their accomplishments are going to come to a screeching halt uh, because the old muff diver is all over them. David, over to you. Yeah, and it's very, in the U.K., you'd call this real schoolboy humor, particularly boarding schools like Eton. Yeah. Uh, but uh, let's, uh, let's pass that for a moment. So we had Sentry bringing in the weapons and ammunition and drugs to be placed in caches. I think I taught you what a cache was, Phil, didn't I? Yes, as a matter of fact, I'm going to demonstrate how good your teaching is by, by showing some, <clears throat> some cash to the crowd. Uh, these are beer coupons. You take these, you can even spend these in England, I've done it. But if you spend these in England, you'll get a bad exchange rate and your change will come in penny farthings and whatever they call them, pesos or pounds. Uh, but yes, I know what cash is, C-A-C-H-E. And you know that Obama's uh, biological donor, Frank Marshall Davis, wrote a book called Gash Gourmet? Uh, yes, I did. Let's leave it right there for the ladies. Over to you, David. Yeah, so the Century program, which is basically a corruption by senior public servants, including your sister's SES team, and organized crime developed the caches that would be necessary for any successful attempt to overthrow the government of the United States on 911 and subsequently. And of course, we should, must never forget that uh, CERCO operates the United States Defense Ammunition Center, which has been supplying ammunition to ISIS or ISIL, whatever you like to call it. <laughs> and I believe recently they bought about a billion, 1.3 billion rounds of hollow point <laughs> ammunition. Anyway, let's take care of Sentry. Interesting thing about JABS is the Joint Automated Booking System. I think now, feel realistically, we should say that this is a core element in the rendition program set up by your sister in Circo, 
1994, where they needed to book um, prisoners to be waterboarded or interrogated into remote parts of the world like Diego Garcia, together with those people who got turned on by torturing a child to death in front of the parent, or the parent to death in front of the child, to extract the kind of information that anyone would offer in order to prevent that happening. And uh, I think you and I, just before the radio show, had discussed the idea of Abel Danger demanding that uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed be recovered from where he is, the assumption being that his sister hasn't had him whacked, and presented to Congress uh, to say exactly what he was doing on 911, <laughs> and compare that with what Hillary Clinton was doing on 911, or Bill Clinton or any of the other scumbags that orbit around the Clinton enterprise. Do you think that's a fair uh, objective? Over to you. Yes, and I want you to know that you have a fan in Portland, Oregon, and before, uh, before the, the ladies in Portland get confused, I'm talking in this case about Agent 66, who just commented in the chat room, oh, I love David. He's as naive as me, meaning her, Agent 66, not me, uh, whoever I am. But anyway, uh, Whatever you just said, I'm in total agreement because, see, we can pretty much say anything we want at this point, and nobody is ever going to uh, sue us for libel, especially my sister, um, who I have petitioned the Commandant of the Marine Corps, General Joseph Dunford, who is six years behind me in seniority. Uh, and I say that because I was commissioned in the Marine Corps in 71, and Johnny come lately showed up in 77. So I'm, I'm suggesting to him, as clearly as I can, in open emails, that if he has charges of treason delivered on his desk and he doesn't move on them, he's guilty of misprision of treason, and that's punishable by seven years in prison. And if you got out for good behavior, like, say, in three years, uh, you wouldn't last very long because there's a whole lot of pissed-off veterans uh, who have found out that there's two sets of books. The corporate officers running the military branches are paid very handsomely uh, by the Vatican uh, and some people in Europe that bank. And the people that get shot up, and I don't know how, I, let me see if, ah, you know what I just did, don't you, Ginger? Ginger, tell them what I just did. You get such a kick out of it when I do that. Afterburner's here, and I think Swamper Mom is here. Yep. Um, David, what was I just talking about? Because I want one of the, oh, never mind, I got it. Swamper Mama and Afterburner are two of the fastest image Googlers in our camp. And I'm trying to remember the name of the young man, uh, Taylor, T-A-Y-L-O-R, Taylor Morris, M-O-R-R-I-S. Would one of you ladies, Afterburner being from Brighton, uh, England, and Swamper Mama being from the Panhandle of Florida, here in the colonies, would one of you ladies put up a picture of Taylor Morris? Because the enlisted forces of the United States military are deserving of one set of books and leaders with integrity. And I, I guess this is sort of a public statement. I find certain generals and admirals as totally lackluster in leadership when they're being paid millions. Uh, well, take a look at Al Haig. He died a billionaire. Of course, you can't spend a billion in hell, can you? And that's probably where he ended up unless he had a deathbed confession. What does that mean, deathbed confession? Uh, does it mean you confess that you're wrong? No, it means that you confess that you finally figured out who's in charge of the world, and it's neither me nor uh, George Elise or David Hawkins. The world is controlled by the Creator. David, over to you. Thanks, Phil. And um, so we now know that Jabs, which incidentally was developed by Nortel, the company that they did the pump and dump on, and probably ripped off the shareholders to the tune of about double what happened with Enron. So Nortel developed public key infrastructure. And they also developed uh, jabs for the United States Department of Justice, i.e. the three women who were in the Great Hall of Justice crowing about the reinvention of government. So that's interesting, because where is Nortel now? Well, folks, 
disappeared. A major hedge fund dump, huge profit to Clinton insiders, and the patent pool of Nortel, which was the crown jewels of uh, Canada, is now in the hands of Al Gore and Apple, plus uh, Microsoft. So very dirty treatment of the Canadian allies by the Americans, but not the American citizens who don't know anything about it. But I've got a name for you, Phil, uh, uh, a relative of Christopher Stevens. And I'm going to pop it in the chat room. And I think this would be a very interesting man for you to speak to. So I'll pop that into the chat room. And these are his words about Osama, not Osama, Obambi, after the um, murder of uh, Christopher Stevens in Benghazi. America, I saw firsthand how cold this man is, what kind of liar he is. Most of you haven't a clue about this tyrant. And then the chat room has basically dropped me out of my chat room, but I'll continue. Anyway, it's the United States Marine Corps retired or senior pastor field. Okay. Can you see that in the chat room? No, I don't. Uh, what, am I, what am I looking for? Uh, th this uh, gentleman who uh, is so abrasive about... Obama, but he's a United States Marine, yep. and he's a pastor, and he's a cousin of Christopher Stevens. So I'm inviting you to contact him. Over to you. Well, are you talking about Dr. Charles M. Charles R. Roots, senior pastor? Yes, I am. Well, I'll yes. show you. I'll show you how our chat room works. If anybody can find a contact uh, mechanism for that senior pastor, I will. Uh, not only will I communicate with him openly and visibly, I'll invite him to come on the radio show. I'll do a radio show with him briefly, and we can hear his story. Uh, and I just love how active our chat room is. I got several pictures of Taylor Morris, and uh, Taylor Morris is a young man who lives down in Iowa, and when he went over to Afghanistan to ensure that the flow of heroin continues to enrich the Clinton Foundation, uh, Tony B. Liar, the Cameron Queers, uh, and my sister. Nobody told him that he would be over there uh, risking his life and limb, and in his case, he left three and a half limbs over there. Uh, and on one hand, I would hate to meet him someday uh, I'd love to meet him and put my arms around him and thank him, but I think I would probably start crying because I know fully well who he lost his limbs for, and it's a bunch of fucking bankers. David, over to you. It's probably about 7,000 bankers, Phil. Well, good. They should all be shot. Oh, why don't and you say... That, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead and be smart. Okay, the reason for that is where I, and I didn't pull the 7,000 bankers out of the air, it's your sister's comment in January of 2001 that she had up to 7,000 bankers in the Small Business Administration Program uh, begging her to accelerate or expedite the loan guarantee program. So if an 8A company wanted a loan, let's say to whack um, Pat Tillman or Christopher Stevens, with a certain amount of risk uh, requiring you to pay off the police and the local gendarmes in the area where the whacking is to be done, they wanted it rapidly approved because there might not be an opportunity after about 60 minutes to whack Christopher Stevens. So the small business that responsible for the whacking and the wacky would want to be able to have that loan from one of these banks, let's say HSBC would be a good one, you know, the, the world's leading drug hub banker, uh, HSBC might cavil at the idea of lending this small business administration, 8A company, yes, affiliated presumably with the White Mountain Group in Benghazi, $5 million to pay off all the people who had to look away or stand down so they could get to Christopher Stevens and torture him to death. So your sister needed to accelerate that process, and she claims she got it under 60 minutes. <coughs> the guarantee, or the final guarantor, is the taxpayer. So that means uh, we, collectively, or Americans in general who pay taxes, are in fact uh, propping up this uh, corrupt network <coughs> with targeted hits that take place all around the world on a regular basis, particularly these bakers' dozen of aircraft. But I digress. 
So anyway, that takes care of jabs. And the interesting thing is, if you want to run a rendition torture program, you need A, to get the suspect or victim in a safe place, let's say Diego Garcia, and then you need to, as I say, fly in people who evidently get turned on by torturing a child to death in front of the parents, <coughs> or the parents to death in front of the children. I believe the teams in Abu Ghraib, um, specialized British teams in feeding uh, parents through a shredder, feet first, while the children looked on. And presumably the uh, snuff film was backhauled to the kind of people who get excited about that, a great profit. So, in order to get those kind of people, where do you go? Well, you dip into your sister's prison systems. Or for that matter, the prisons run privately by Circo in the UK. So I think, Phil, back in 1994, Circo and your sister generated, and I'm sure the conspiracy existed uh, decades before, but in its modern form, conspired to set up a global rendition and torture network for the Five Eyes countries to entrap and then extort and blackmail otherwise decent people working in the governments of said Five Eyes countries. And of course you can get vermin like the Clintons or the Obamas um, at the drop of the hat, particularly if you dig into the prison systems. And then you take over, for example, the National Visa Center, where in their wisdom, the Seeking Your Executive Service outsourced the operation of the United States National Visa Center to Circo, presumably, so either domestically or in foreign clients, they could recruit the kind of people that would be necessary to populate the rendition center and, let's say, for example, waterboard Khalid Sheikh Mohammed 183 times. How many things would you admit to, Field, if you faced the prospect of being waterboarded 183 times? Over to you. Well, I admit to having um, indiscreet relationships with Afterburner, Agent 66, Alicia, not Axel, not Bent Ranch, not Bob Simpson, not Calvin Jones. Uh, not Dave D, not you, uh, Denise C, not me, uh, not Free Agent, not George, the Ginger Cookie, yes, Jack Mack, no, James Ken, no, John Patterson, a.k.a. Reefway, no, Kay Foster, I don't know, because I don't know what the K stands for, Maranatha, yes, Matt McLeod, no, Mensa Max, no, NWA, no, Autopilot, no, Patty Windsor, yes, Preston Brooks, no, Randy Town, no. Ryan Wilson, no. Sheila M, yes. Stephen uh, Slingshot Penicate, uh, no. Straight Shot, no. Strike Three, unknown, because I don't know about Straight Shot or Strike Three, what gender they are. Swamp Rat, of course. Texas Maverick, often. Vanishing Point, no. Do you know how I discriminated between the yeses and the noes, David? No, Phil. Oh, well, you weren't listening, that's why, because everyone I said yes to was a female, and everyone I said no to was a male, and that's because I'm an overt, heterosexual, semal, sexagenarian. Let's start with overt. Do you know what overt means, yes or no? Yes. How about uh, heterosexual, yes or no? Yes. How about semal, C-E-M-A-W, yes or no? No. It stands for coedally experienced men and women, which means people that cannot get government jobs. Um, because to rise in government jobs, especially to the senior executive service, you have to be a raging homosexual. Your dog apparently is gay, David. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, but C now um, means you've got a soft C in that loop, which I don't like, because you used a hard C with coedally. Well, uh, so are you telling me you prefer hard or you prefer soft? Uh, let's move on. Good idea. Over to you. Okay, so we've got, there's a core element of a rendition and torture program to reinvent government. I'm going to take my dog out for a pea field and then bring it back in. Over okay, to so do I have to sit here and entertain people? Uh, yeah, well, okay. I don't know if you're going to entertain them. Yeah, but, yeah I'm, uh, I'm going to sing a song. Uh, in fact, there's someone out there listening, let me just, yeah, I just saw her name, 
Uh, let me see if she's still here. And in all seriousness, someone asked me yesterday or the day before if I could help them establish a more firm foundation uh, of Christian understanding, and the answer is yes, I can. In fact, at home on a piece of paper this big, I have three signs circled, uh, and I will, when I get home, I will find that, and I will send an email to the person that wants to uh, solidify their foundation in Christ. And just because someone believes in God and believes in Jesus doesn't mean they're mamby-pamby, as Obama and my sister are finding out every, every other day. But it goes like this. Lead me, O oh Lord, won't you lead me? I am weak and I need thy strength and power. Lead me, O oh Lord. In my darkest hour, oh, just always thy servant, let me be. Lead me, oh Lord, won't you lead me? That has the distinction of being the only song that I'm aware of that Elvis Presley only performed once live. Uh, it's a wonderful song. And watch how fast somebody named Tex Mav or Swamp or Maranatha or Afterburner, somebody's going to find Lead Me, Guide Me by Elvis, and they'll post it so people can listen to the words and let them sink in. Uh, the other two songs, one of them I think is Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, uh, and the other one I can't remember right now. That's why I wrote things. In fact, I got proof. Watch this. Anything that's important, I write down here. This book, it's green and it has no cover. But I, I mean, it has a cover, but it doesn't have a mission. But I'm going to write the mission statement on it right now. Um, and hopefully some of you will be able to see it. Um, because on my next trip to the UK, I am going to this location. And if anybody can read this, I'll go... Out and in and in and out and in and out. And hopefully somebody can see where I'm going on my next trip to the United Kingdom, which should be, say, about 10 days from now, give or take. In fact, today, according to my Walmart, today is Wednesday, the 11th of October. Oh, I thought I was going in August, but I guess I got confused. David, I know you're back, so go ahead. Uh, yeah, Tim, so I was just... <laughs> how you can combine those three projects uh, to reinvent government, at least stand a chance of reinventing government, where Sentry brings in the ammunition and the weapons and the drugs uh, and parks them in caches that I would suggest, Field, were uh, coincident with the historically underutilized business zones created by, by your sister and John Kerry for the Small Business Administration. And if you look at every major city in the United States, there will be pockets of relative poverty or uh, industrial areas that have fallen into decay. And of course, they make a great area for storing in old warehouses the weapons and the drugs and the ammo ready for an attempted coup d'etat. You know, these places like I understand Detroit is a disaster zone. Maybe because, mainly because the socialists have gutted the automobile industry, which is full of outstandingly competent engineers and technicians, etc., etc., and basically with a program to deindustrialize America and impoverish its citizens, created great opportunities to warehouse the weapons to overthrow the state. Um, so that would be Sentry. Uh, JABS is the Joint Automated Booking System where you book the victims of a rendition and torture program so they arrive at a place where they can be tortured unobserved and uh, offer to the various perverted citizens in America and around the world under the 8A program the opportunity, as I say, to torture these people to death, recorded on film and create an archive that intimidates the people who survive. And then... Um, uh, so that's jabs, and uh, JPATS, of course, is to physically transport um, 
the people who can engage as either victims or as uh, executioners in that rendition and torture program. And I believe that started uh, no later than 1988. Do you know what conversation I'm talking about there, Phil? Over to you. I wasn't listening because James can just put up a comment, and I'll just give my partial thing. And then I'll give me the, I'm buying time so I can think. Um, James can said, uh, where is it? I finally got over Elvis, to which I, I'm commenting right now. Uh, James can, have you ever been to the Memorial Garden at Graceland? And I put MY because I was going to say my guess is no. Um, so I'm going to answer your question after. i got to sing this for Afterburner. <clears throat> lead me, O oh Lord, won't you lead me? I'm tired and I need thy strength and power to guide me over my darkest hour. Or just open my eyes that I may see. Lead me, O oh Lord, won't you lead me? Lead me, guide me along the way. For if you lead me, I cannot stray. Oh, just open my eyes that I may see. Lead me, O oh Lord, won't you lead me? So you just led me to a question about December of 1988, and it took me two stanzas of that song to run it through my Mod 1 Mark II uh, thinker. And what I've come up with, and I didn't hear your question, but I heard the date, December of 88. Any chance you were talking about when I told my sister how to drone airplanes? Let's review the steps. Yes, sir. Microphone on, speak. Okay, was that a yes? Yes. Good, since I got the answer correctly, I'm going to take a vacation. Over to you. Oh, okay. All right, so this to me now has increased significantly in importance as far as the Able Danger saga is concerned because in December... 1988, I believe we have the first personal experience in your life of a conspiracy to overthrow the government or reinvent the government of the United States through a Five Eyes rendition and torture program. Because when your sister asked how to take care of a mutiny on an aircraft carrying prisoners from Hawaii to the mainland, of course, from a generic point of view, that question works just as well if you're carrying prisoners out to Diego Garcia and they understand what's in store for them and they start to riot and your sister and her cronies in the senior executive service would need to be able to initiate procedures that took the control of the aircraft away from the mutiny, mutinying prisoners and returned it to the controller of the conspiracy, which is to use rendition and torture as an instrument to cow government leaders, military leaders, law enforcement leaders <coughs> in the free or sovereign states of the world and established a regime of fear. Mm -hmm. So when you replied in 1988, and I guess it was unwittingly you didn't realize that you were actually showing this benighted sister of yours the mechanism by which she could introduce that uh, matrix, if you will, and reinvent government, not just in the United States of America, but every country that was standing in the way of the Five Eyes countries in terms of the New World Order. So now, I'm quite sure that when those technologies were developed for the Vibeyes countries, and we know who developed them in World War II, it was an outfit called RCAGB 1929, which was a branch office of Radio Corporation of America and the Rockefeller Center, headed up by David Sarnoff, who was on the telegraph machine when the Titanic, masquerading as the Olympia, was called into an iceberg. Other way around. It was the Olympic masquerading as the Titanic. Okay, thank you. Peter. You're welcome. I stand directed. So, the intriguing thing about this is the strategy of using rendition and torture to 
establish a dominant control over we the people dates back, I believe, at least to the star chamber of the Elizabethan era. Now, I'm not a historian, I'm just a poor schmuck who was an engineer, now I'm a forensic economist. I think just hovering above you in terms of the scale of forensic eco economics, so you get a view of what passes underneath me, but uh, the sky just above you is blue and clear field. That's a mixed metaphor. What do you have to say? Well, you said something that passes beneath you. Uh, my similar device is not beneath me. It's projected at 90 degrees forward, just like King Ra, R-A, the Egyptian god of guess what? Do you know what King Ra was a god of? King Ra. No, Ra, R-A. R oh, son. I don't know about that. I'll put it out to the chat room. Chatters. What was King Ra's uh, super ability according to legend? Anyway, David, you continue while these guys give us the raw raw treatment. Okay, Phil. So I wanted to just emphasize, incidentally, I have to go at 12.15. Is that all right? I don't know. My time or your time? Uh, my time. Okay, 12.15, your time is 25 minutes from now. Yeah. Yeah, we'd appreciate your going. You can leave early if you wish. But meanwhile, I'm wondering if Sunshine wants to see a barefoot. I'm waiting. Now, apparently, there's a lot of people watching today. I don't know how they monitor this, but apparently our chat room or live stream, either or, has 100 people. Um, wasn't it Kings? Yeah, that's right. Free agent, wherever you are, and I think you're in Kansas City. You're the Kansas City, Kansas City, here I come. They got some pretty little women there, and I'm going to get me some. Actually, Wilbur Harrison said, I'm going to get me one. But I think people should have a broad mind. So, hence, I changed the word from one to some. And that can be taken two different ways, can it? So, let's see. Um, David, I asked you about King Ra. And uh, Free Agent says, wasn't it King Ra's PTRC? Now, do you know what a PTRC is, David? Sounds obscene, at least the PT part. Yeah, it is obscene. It's a purple-tipped red champion. Over to you. See, so I was right. Yeah, you were right. So we're not discussing then our priority in terms of forensic economics in the greater echelon of forensic economics, are we? Uh, no, but the reason I bring up these uh, gender-specific comments is because when we first started writing books, which was in November of 2007, I sat there and I had about a seven day growth of beard and I scratched my beard and I thought, how best to get inside my sister's head and blow her brains out? And then I thought, obviously, if I write about a lot of heterosexual stuff in an overt manner uh, and always in a consensual capsule, it'll probably drive all these queers in DC nuts because the last thing they want to do is what they don't they don't ever want to read a story that involves a donut and a kickstand so guess what that's all i think about that's all i write about and that's all they're going to get right up until they're given a short rope a long drop and because of uh you know our budgetary woes they're not going to get a blindfold or a cigarette david over to you yeah absolutely good and uh, so i just want to because i'm going to leave in about 20 minutes i just want to talk about the big picture with the fourth uh, paragraph in today's post. McConnell will expose the principal actors and their criminal, but nearly perfectly synchronized MO, modus operandi, which allegedly resulted in the wrongful death of Christopher Stevens in McConnell's ebook, Shaking Hands with the Devil's Clocks. Now, that might need a little explanation. Shake Hands with the Devil is the title of a book or a film, or perhaps both recording the journey by uh, Romeo Dallaire, the Canadian Major General, I think he was at the time, when he was caught between the Hutus and the Tutsis in Rwanda after the Hutu president had been shot down in a Falcon 50, a Dassault Falcon 50, as he was coming into land at the main airport near the capital city, which name <laughs> I forget. <laughs> now, this is a clear example, I think, of the reinvention of government 
involving terror uh, imputed into the minds and souls of the otherwise decent people in Rwanda, who up to then, I don't say it was a peaceful situation, but it was nothing like the, the genocide to come, were not killing each other in large numbers. Now, in any script that relates to a planned and programmed genocide, there's a lot of synchronous activities that have to go on if you're going to put off the genocide undetected or unpunished. In the case of Rwanda, it required the importation of one million machetes Ooh. made in Egypt by, or not made by, but exported by the former foreign minister for Egypt, a man by the name of Boutros Boutros Ghali, who would become the Secretary General of the United Nations. And then, after that, I believe the equivalent in the La Francophonie. But I digress. So if you want to kill a million citizens in Rwanda, it's no coincidence that you import one million machetes. Now, does that mean one individual per machete per hacking of the Achilles tendon so that the individual to be killed could be left crawling on the road so they can come out later and subsequently kill them? I don't know. That's not my speciality. But it does require a significant amount of logistics, which, of course, is the raw material of any self-respecting forensic economist to establish the instruments needed to kill people in those numbers and then perhaps to look at the possibility of a deeper conspiracy to overthrow the government of Rwanda and through fear pass off the controls to organizations such as the one your sister is responsible for with Circa. So where would you get the kind of people who could a, write a propaganda script so that as soon as that plane was shot down... FBI! Uh, yes, absolutely, Phil. Department of Justice, Hollywood, of course. People at the BBC. There's a whole bunch of very able writers who can take an event and make it real or make it realistic. The problem, of course, is to get the synchronicity between the spin that's coming out on the media with the event on the ground as it actually happens in God's time. And of course, being human, these people screw it up. And they screw it up because they're playing with a number of clocks. The clocks made by human beings, which includes, for example, the United States Naval Observatory Master Clock, which I think might be in Boulder, Colorado. I'm not sure about that, Phil. There's the National Physical Laboratory Clock in uh, Tellington in Middlesex which is a refinement of something invented in the 1950s. There's the clock on the mantelpiece above uh, the handshaking Hillary Clinton and David Cameron that looks to me like an antique clock of something like the period 1710. There's the clock of Greenwich Mean Time where the meridian actually passes underneath that clock. And that's the clock... <coughs> that was slave to the uh, accessory clocks that sent the signal along the under Atlantic cable somewhere around the period of 1865 to be received at Harvard University. Except they said in 1865 or 1864 that that cable had broken. They don't produce any proof that it had been broken. So it's quite possible in 1864 that cable carried the first uh, synchronizing signal between Harvard University and the Greenwich Mean Time clock that would have allowed remote assassination betting on the time of the death of Abraham Lincoln. So the idea of remote assassination betting did not come into being um, when the internet came into being. It might have come hundreds of years before when the British or the English were making super accurate clocks in the latter part of the 18th century. In fact, a man called John Harrison won the Admiralty Prize, I think he something like 100,000 pounds, for uh, precise 
the calculations of uh, longitude with his marine chronometer that journeyed on a ship from Bristol to, I believe, uh, the West Indies and back lost about five seconds in a, a six-week journey, which revolutionized precise navigation and actually, in my opinion, put the Royal Navy on a strategic collision course with sovereign states with navies around the world which exist to this day. And basically, to cut to the chase, I'm saying that today, your sister and Circo have the option of switching time at a crime scene between the US Naval Observatory Master Clock and the National Physical Laboratory Clock in Teddington, Middlesex. And when they switch one to the other, the good guys are disrupted and lose their ability to communicate with each other. And the bad guys are synchronized to switch an exercise into a real attack. And that's what happened on 911, and that's how, and that's what happened on those aircraft that were hijacked on 91 and subsequently, where your sister, through an 8A company called Innoventor, installed cesium clocks on E4 BBs. You feel how many uh, could be continuously in operation? I think there are four. Is is one always kept on the ground over to you? Uh. Well, unless all four are flying, at least one's always on the ground. What you're thinking of, and you're accurate, uh, there's one on the ground at Andrews, the identifier of which, according to ICAO, is K-I-A-D. Uh, you can't make this stuff up. It's just north of Clinton, Maryland. Um, and sometimes, some lady just said she likes my singing, so I'm going to sing something. For, I don't remember who the lady was, but maybe she'll put her name in so I like your singing again. It could have been ba 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 baran ba 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 baran oh take my hand I change that when I sing it I say gland instead of hand but I'm not singing anymore uh, back to Andrews do you think David if I told you that in 1969 excuse me if I told you in 1970 the summer of 70 I had a white 454 Corvette and I I'm not going to say girlfriend, but there was a young lady whose mother wanted me to get interested in the young lady. Um, and the young lady was very nice, by the way. And since she was very nice, and since nothing ever happened, I can say her name as soon as it comes back to me. Um, the doctor's, the, her stepfather's name will also have to come back to me, but he was the radiologist for Nixon. And he was really, he was really obviously very bright if he's a radiologist, but he was also, he had a great sense of humor. And since they had no male children, uh, and especially since it was his stepdaughter, not his biological daughter, <clears throat> so he's not as protective as I think most of us biological. I have a stepdaughter too, and I was even more protective of her than my own biological daughters, because I thought she'd been dealt a shorthand by fate. But uh, Dr. Warren Early, W-A-R-R-E-N, Early, E-A-R-L-Y. Okay, you master Googler, see if anybody can find anything about Nixon's radiologist, Dr. Warren Early. I can't remember Mrs. Early's name because back then I was 20 years old and I would always say Mrs. Early because I, even if I knew her first name, I wouldn't use it. But the young lady's name was Lori. Uh, and Lori Early and I used to go on what I guess you'd call dates, like we'd go out to dinner or we'd go out for a ride in the Corvette. In fact, she and one of her girlfriends and I, three of us were in my Corvette. And I know, I know what you're thinking, there's only two seats. Well, I, I was on the side with the steering wheel and the two girls, I don't remember who was on top or who was on bottom, it doesn't matter. But we went out and we, uh, we saw a marquee at a small bar and it said, Gary Puckett and the Union Gap, to which I thought, well, there's got to be two Gary Puckets because the real Union Gap wouldn't play a dive like this. We went in there, and it was the real Gary Puckett and the Union Gap, and they were really playing a small dive. And they were very nice young men, and they all had uh, POW bracelets on. But here's the part. I want you to tell me if you believe it, David. Do you believe that in the summer of 1970 that Dr. Warren Early, radiologist to the president, Nixon, do you believe he, had, he would have ever poured two martinis 
and told me to take him for a ride around Andrews Air Force Base, yes or no? With you, Field, yes. It's absolutely true. And the funny part is, that was his idea. Uh, I had never, I don't know if I'd ever, yeah, okay, I would have had uh, an encounter with strong alcohol before, but I certainly had never seen a martini. But you know what? If you sit there with the, the president's radiologist and his daughter is fairly attractive, uh, what's wrong with hopping in the vet martini in hand and going for a ride around Andrews Air Force Base? Because they can stop me and get as upset as they want, but Dr. Early would have the final word, even if he had to call uh, his patient, Richard Milhouse Quaker. David, over to you. Yeah, well, that's uh, fascinating. And James Kinn has just put a picture of, uh, I can see some blonde hair, and in the background, a clock. And uh, clocks are fascinating to me because my dad, um, rest in peace, was a clock collector. So I was very early in life exposed to these beautiful uh, contraptions. And um, what always struck me was the difficulty in synchronizing clocks because on a Sunday morning in this old house we had in Kent countryside in England, my job was to go around to about 60 or 70 clocks, wind them up and synchronize them to 12 o'clock. So at 12 o'clock all hell would break loose. And just a, as a, an aside, my father, unbeknown to me, he, he bought a German speaking clock on an endless tape that actually said the time in a very guttural German accent. I didn't know that. I came back late one night, um, and this was a very old creaky house, allegedly haunted, and I didn't want my parents to know what time I got in, but I, tip, I was tiptoeing along the corridor, and I passed this German clock, and it said, the time is 12 o'clock, right? And I nearly died. You know, I'm not so superstitious, but it was very spooky. Anyway, setting that aside, Field, the great problem from the United States military and the, Ameri um, the Canadian, the British, and New Zealand and Australian uh, military is when you're in joint operations, whose clock are you going to use? Are you going to use the devil's clock? Are you going to use the United States Naval Observatory master clock? Are you going to use the National Physical Laboratory clock in Teddington? Or are you going to use a Walmart watch on the wrist of... Um, a field, uh, McConnell. I mean, what what would you propose over you? I wasn't even listening. Could you uh, could you shorten that question up to something which is manageable? Okay. If you're in a maneuver like you know, 911, whose yep. clock are you going to use to synchronize the movements of the I don't know the happy hooligans over to you? Uh, you don't really need this. Once you get up there to where the action is, you know, time is not important. Uh, taking care of business is the only thing that matters. But I will tell you that uh, I've, I've, some people like my flying stories. Here comes one. Um, I was tasked to go out to Fresno Air National Guard Base and to arrive at such and such a time on some given day, let's say Thursday, and I was supposed to arrive so that the aircraft could be regenerated that means refueled and weapons put on. Uh, and we were going to participate in an exercise flying against the Fresno Air National Guard, Air National Guard unit. Uh, the only problem was, I can still remember the backseater's name, and uh, it's Don Sandborg, who's now a Christian pastor in Minneapolis. But Don and I had a brief discussion in Fargo before we took off and flew getting an air refueling somewhere so we didn't have to land. I was always too lazy to land. I'd rather go make up a song and dance and get some free gas. I see the time's getting close. But anyway, we looked at our watches and we said, well, we have to be out there at 1600 Zulu. And it's uh, 1200 Zulu now, so we have four hours to get there. Uh, the only problem was it wasn't Zulu, it was local. So we arrived two, two or three hours after the exercise uh, had gone without us. But, you know, sometimes when you screw things up, Accidentally, you might not participate in an exercise, but if you have people, morons like the McCain trio, um, McCain wants to have French tankers. What a, I was going to say douchebag, but I can't say that. What a dolt. Um, all you have to do is have software in the French tankers that the U.S. Air Force doesn't know about, and nobody's getting any gas. And so it would look like somebody beat the United States of America. As of right now, 
I don't think anybody can beat the United States of America. Uh, Russia and Israel, maybe if they work jointly, could. Uh, nobody else can. But it's the uh, it's the perverts that bank and the perverts that serve Satan that want the United States to get weaker and weaker so we can be uh, put out of their misery. What I mean by their misery? There's a lot of people that have a lot of a retirement income that's being serviced by the Vatican and the bankers in Europe, and they don't like that. And guess what? They can kiss my ass. David, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Phil. I saw some comments about who invented the Internet, and I think it's worth remembering this guy, Donald Davis, who was a Welsh computer scientist. To all intents and purposes, he invented or materialized uh, packet switching. That's the core of the Internet. And in 1984, which you and I feel know is a very important year in your sister's career, uh, he retired from the National Physical Laboratory and went to work in London for the banking industry. And your point about uh, the happy hooligans uh, going to the place uh, where the action is, of course, from, I, and this is my assumption, when you're inside your plane, it's very hard to get a view of where the strategic action is as opposed to the tactical, the tactical action. And the moment they plug a squadron or whatever it is of uh, happy hooligans together and then tie them back to a, the devil's clock, they're going to go in the wrong direction, which is what they did on 911. And conversely, when you take the civilian the passenger aircraft that are flying on 911 and plug their autopilot systems uh, that impute the waypoints into the devil's clock, those aircraft are going to go in the wrong direction. Um, and as far as the people on board are concerned, if they have no means of communication, because their network time protocols to communicate with the ground have been jammed. Hence all these planes. You never get a Mayday report from a plane that's about to be hijacked by the devil's clock. So the book field uh, today, that post I sent you, uh, is an outline of what I think, and of course ultimately the books and the general strategy is yours, and yours alone, is the idea that you would take a, an individual wrongful death, such as Christopher Stevens, and then through the collective research of Able Death Angel, we feed you characters that can be written into the book. The hero, if that's the right word, his name is Chips. And effectively what I see, and that's just my opinion, CHIPS becomes the crucible for everything that you've done in your life and the people you know, together with everything that Abel Danger has collectively learned that can create a character that knocks James Bond into a barrel of fish, which is a mixed metaphor. Over to you. I saw a great image yesterday of fish and chips, <clears throat> and uh, it was a human body <coughs> and then there were some french fries in a certain location. David, it was, uh, it's going to be 12.15 soon, so don't be late. Uh, actually, Field, I've just realized I was in my antique septuagenarian. Um, I got it wrong, so I can't get to the bottom of the hour. Keep going. Okay. Uh, if anybody remembers sending me an image, and I think it was Randy T., I think. I... And for those of you who think I don't pay attention to emails because I don't respond, <clears throat> actually I do whatever possible. <clears throat> but I get so many emails uh, that I sometimes can't respond to them in a timely fashion. And I didn't put the image of fish and chips in today's radio show ad, not because I didn't think it was funny. I do think it was funny. I just think it's offensive to 50% of the world's people. And uh, I don't want to offend men or women. I want to offend treasonous bastards. And if there's a female or a male that's treasonous and they're bastards, which, of course, anybody who's treasonous is a bastard by my definition, and I am the boss with the hot sauce, so the nominations are closed. Uh, I don't care if they're a lesbian or a gay twit like uh, Barry Spatero, Punahou 79. I don't care if they have an outrageous, dorky looking face like the current Secretary of State. I don't care if they're an offensive pig 
lesbian, my phone just made a little bit of noise. And just for David Hawkins' uh, disgruntlement, would somebody please dial 715-307-8222? I promise not to answer, so it won't cost you anything. But the reason I like to do that is it shows everybody that we're live and unscripted and that David and I don't agree on everything. However, I do agree to turn, over, turn it over to him since he only has 14 minutes left. Over to you, David. Yeah, thank you. I see Axel um, has some uh, difficulty grasping the importance of the clock and why we keep emphasizing it. I understand that. <clears throat> so I put up an image of the U.S. Naval Observatory master clock, and I'm about to put up an image of the NPL clock, and then I just want to explain what happens if the targeted uh, weapons platform, which could be MH370, or it could be the drone that took out the Pentagon, is suddenly swapped from one of these clocks to another, <clears throat> because that basically shifts who gets to control the, the terminal weapon. Hey, David. Yeah, sure. Do you see somebody just called me? I can hear it. Yeah, let's see that. That proves that we're live because I, you didn't dial me, did you? Yeah. I didn't dial me either. And a lot of women are going to be surprised when I say this, but this person that called me from area code 715-497-XXYY is a granny. Uh, but not the type of a granny that some of you ladies are, which means grandmother. This granny was an F-15 pilot in the Air Force, then he flew at Northwest Airlines. He lives near Eau Claire. And, uh, and if, if I had to use a fake name for Granny, I'd probably call him Poke Salad Annie because the, gate, the gators got her Granny. Uh, David, over to you. Yeah, so uh, I've got the picture of the, the National Physical Laboratory season fountain clock in the 1950s. <laughs> and the most recent U.S. Naval Observatory uh, master clock that is currently used or allegedly used for all arms of the American military, provided they don't get it. It's okay, David. Keep talking. Okay, provided they don't get hacked. Now, if you have a brain-dead expressions like human attention, who takes top-secret information and process it through a server in her home, there's a very strong probability that either the U.S. Naval Observatory master clock gets hacked or the NPL clock gets hacked or both. That is to say you can create a third uh, timing standard which temporarily you can call the stratum zero, which allegedly is the most accurate clock. The position you then have to take is if human beings can interfere in what is seen by the intranets around the world in establishing what is stratum zero time, the question we have to ask ourselves, mm -hmm. is that the devil's clock or God's clock? Now, I'm not subtle enough as a theosopher or a uh, study in religious, the arcane aspects of the universe. Maybe Theo can give us some guidance here. But the problem, the poor schmuck in the fighter pilot's plane, or the guy flying MH370 or MH17, he has absolutely zero way of knowing whether the timing signals he's getting are coming from the devil's clock or God's clock. And the consequences are fatal. And they're fatal to the crime scene investigations because unless you are able to reverse engineer things with the precision of able danger, you can never unravel the discrepancies between the timelines of the various key assets that are passing through the crime scene, from the pilot to the corpse that was shed out of the cargo door, presumably from MH17, that had been collected from the rendition center on Diego Garcia, that had been run more or less um, de facto by Christine Marcy, Phil's sister, and Serco since, well, what should we say, 1984, 1988? Remember, Christine Marcy founded the Senior Executive Service in 1970. 79! 
Oh, 79, I'm sorry, for Jimmy Carter. Now, was Jimmy Carter a good president? Phil, depends on your point of view, right? Yeah, if you're a patriot, he was worthless maggot, and if you're a confused person getting government doles and watching TV and growing obese so that you test the tensile strength of your sofa, then you probably would have loved him. Yeah, and I think you're right. So these characters that occupy or squat in the White House, the one president in recent memory, because of his military background, that could have distinguished between the devil's clock and God's clock and man's clock, in my opinion, was George Bush. Because I think fighter pilots, whether they're retired or not, have a better sense in terms of their professional expertise of time than almost any other profession. Because if I understand Phil correctly, you can be closing in on a target at 4,000 miles an hour, which doesn't give you a lot of time to respond correctly. Is that fair enough, Phil? Uh, I wasn't listening. I was looking at somebody's pink slip from high school. Uh, Barbara Ann says, please be safe, and I don't know who she's talking to. Uh, she might be talking to me or you or both of us. Uh, there's no safety here and there's no luck here. Um, and if I don't want to be dismissive of your concern, Barbara Ann. Ba, 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 Barbara Ann. Ba, 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 Barbara Ann. Oh, take my hand. Barbara Ann. You got him rocking and rolling, rocking and a reeling, Barbara Ann. Ba, ba. Ba ba Ann went to a dance looking for romance, saw Barbara Ann, and I knew she'd fill in the blanks. Anyway, David, what was the question laconically, and I'll give you a bullet faster than a speeding bullet answer. Okay, is it a fair assumption that the fighter pilot's profession gives them a better idea of small spaces of time, given that they may be closing in on each other at 4,000 miles an hour? Yeah, the closing speed might be 4,000, and that what the closing speed means, you take a summation of the two airspeeds. Um, in order to get 2,000 miles an hour, you'd have to be going lickety-split. I say again, lickety-split. Uh, and the only airplanes that I'm aware of that went fast enough, well, if you had an F-4 or an F-15 or an F-14 uh, or some of the Sukhois over in Russia, and you got them cranked up to 16 to 1700, and then you had an SR-71, and I did have some fantastic closure on an SR-71 one day. Uh, I was in, something just went off, I think it's my cell phone, but not the music, so don't be annoyed. But anyway, if the other guy's going 3000, well, let's see, what's, the fastest air-breathing airplane that I'm aware of is the SR-71, uh, which allegedly are no longer flying. Um, they are stationed at Beal, B E A L, uh, Air Force Base in California. That's also where the U 2s or the TR 1s uh, are. And by strange coincidence, David, it's funny you asked me a question about closure because I have a picture, and if, if Jack Max here, he probably has the picture, some other of you have it. There's a picture of myself and Agent James Crosby. Uh, with a U-2, uh, and the U-2 is a photograph on the wall to the left of myself and James Crosby. But I have the original photograph of that U-2 when it was in a secure hangar in what used to be Ramey Air Force Base, Aguadilla, Puerto Rico. And on the nose of the U-2, in chalk, it says a lot of funny things, uh, unprofessional things. And, and I recognize these quickly because I was rather unprofessional in my conduct when I was a pilot, but I was very professional in getting the job done, no matter what it might take. But uh, some of you might scratch your head or any other part of your body and wonder, how could Field McConnell get a picture of that aircraft's radome sitting in a secure hangar in Puerto Rico? Uh, and I guess since we're running out of time, I'll have to answer that in the chat room after you have your final comments in a little bit. Meanwhile, everybody look for a Field McConnell plus Ramey Air Force Base plus U-2 plus image. And the tail number up the top of my head was, mm, was it 8-0 or 8-2? I think it was 8-0. 
and then four more numbers. Uh, I'll figure it out. Anyway, it's a U2S or a U2R model. Uh, somebody will find it, including me. I'll find it after we kick David out in a couple of minutes. David, over to you. Okay, Phil. So just to summarize this idea of the book um, that I shared with uh, uh, GIAC uh, recently, um, and you, obviously, is it would be nice to think that we could focus on a given wrongful death where we don't believe we have enough evidence to get a murder one conviction in the court in any uh, area of justice known to us. Uh, remember, a wrongful death has a lower burden of proof, and the remedy, of course, is primarily damages levied against the parties responsible for the wrongful death, which might be due to their recklessness, negligence, willfulness, or fraud. And a good place to start with your sister, of course, is incompetence and negligence. Uh, if we don't assume that she had mens rea, that she actually wanted to kill Chick Burlingham. <clears throat> so the advantage of that is, if we focus on a given wrongful death, and we can bring together the arguments that demonstrate that the time, as perceived by the victim, has been manipulated, so they walked in or flew into an ambush, like the guys in Extortion 17, then by going for a wrongful death suit, or a class action, we can strip every dollar from a network of organizations that I think, for starters, would include your sister's personal assets, uh, and then going up the scale, everything that the Clinton Foundation thinks it owns, and incidentally, it doesn't distribute money to any needy causes. It's primarily for the Clinton family and their insiders to stay at four-star and five-star hotels and presumably be served up something by the various body women that have accumulated on the journey to get to the position they're in right now. So the idea it would be that it would be an episode or a chapter, maybe 10 to 12 pages, a short story. And just as an example, in this particular post field, what might be fun for you is if you can get in contact with that cousin of Christopher Stevens and bring him on as a real character while Chips uh, reign supreme. Uh, Chips being the man who's done everything you've done in life, and knows everything that Able Danger has collectively learned in our relationship together. So that's, that's a vision, um, and we'll see if that's picked up by Able Danger or in the chat room or the various parties that wish us well, and we can take it from there. So I think um, 1229 field, that's good for me, and um, enjoy the show. Look forward to the next one. Bye now.